By the end of this day, we'll have 274 people die of a drug overdose in this country. Think about it. This is equivalent to an airplane full of passengers crashed and everybody on that plane died. Would well, you think we'll have that on the news? You bet we do. Are we going to have anything on the news about this 274 people that are going to die today from drug overdose? Probably not. That is not a theoretical number. The estimated uh, number for 2021 to be died by drug overdose is 100,000 people in this country. That's the worst that ever been before. We started this journey with the opioid epidemic in 1999, and every day it's up. Between 2019 to 2020, it's 30% up. You know, we have the pandemic, waxing well, wanes, but the epidemic, opioid epidemic, is just up. It is uh, unheard of uh, that we have such tragedies that continue day in and day out, year in, year out. The opioid epidemic, as a matter of fact, is only the tip of the iceberg to something else called addiction. We will have 175,000 people die of alcohol, cigarettes, and other drugs other than the opioid. That makes addictions is the third most common cause of death in this country. In fact, um, it cost the country 740 billion, that's a B, a year. That's what addiction cost us. Think about it. All that fight about the trillions, that will be on two years if we save this money. While you're digesting this undigestible numbers, I can't help tell you that, there, what if I tell you there is a way that we could reduce this tragedies and this cost by about 90%. Keep that number in mind. I'll come back to that number later. And that way is what Ma Martha Luther and King would say, I have a dream. Now, use, I have a dream that we could cut this tragedies by 90% and this cost by 90%. And that way is to reduce exposure of our young boys and girls to any substances of abuse. It is, uh, it is our duty to, uh, as parents, individuals, young people, um, as parents, families, uh, is to follow this strategy, strategy for us uh, to prevent our young people from becoming addicted. And I'll come to the numbers later. But in, in, I'm here to make a case uh, for that exposure, early exposure, of young people to any substance abuse, whether it's cigarettes, alcohol, marijuana, or prescription medications, increases the risk of addiction, later addiction, severe addiction, uh, significantly. And avoiding or protecting our children from that early exposure is one way, probably the most effective way in long term to save our young people from that. To make my point, I'm going to tell you a story. And like any other storytelling, it's real and it's symbolic. Just like any other stories that we heard in our places of worship yesterday, or today, or tomorrow, there is a meaning to that story. And there is something to be extracted out of that story. The story is real because it's my own story. And it's symbolic because it's a story of many Americans in this country. Like I said, it'll be repeated today by the end of the day 274 times. 
And only the details are different in the stories, but, but the beginning and the end is just about the same. So my story is through my son, Adam, who, uh, just like any other kids, uh, in early, early, teen, early teenage years, experimented with cigarettes and alcohol, which I didn't approve of at the time, but I didn't do anything radical to stop it. I figured it's such a passage uh, of teenage years that he'll grow out of it. Later, Adam had shoulder surgery where he had prescription. He went home after his shoulder surgery with 90 tablets of oxycodone. At the time, I thought it was too many, but it, once again, you know, I trusted the doctor. They know what they're doing. I'm, I'm an oral surgeon myself, so I prescribed opioid. I didn't prescribe that much, but I figured, you know, shoulder surgery is different than jaw surgery. Within months from that prescription, Adam became addicted to prescription medications. And literally within months, he became addicted to heroin. When we find out that Adam was addicted to heroin, myself and his, two brother, and his brother and sister, we decided we're going to take him to a treatment center, which uh, he enrolled in and did well, and came out of it after six months of recovery, got a full-time job, and started going to school. And a fall day, like this day, September of 26, Friday, it was a Friday. Adam came to me and wanted to um, want me to buy him books for his classes that he'd taken. He wants to be an EMT. Um, we bought the book, we talked, bought the books, and um, we hugged each other like we always do. And we had the signature goodbye, I love you, Adam, I love you, Dad, with the agreement or the plan that we're going to meet tomorrow, Saturday, for lunch. Saturday never came. And with it, I never trusted tomorrow to come. Next following day, Saturday, I got a call uh, from the hospital that Adam was found with that, not breathing and no pulse, and he was taken to the emergency room. Adam was pronounced dead four days later. And with Adam, Wish and his driver's license, four of his organs, was donated to four different people, two kidneys, liver, and heart. And with Adam, signature off this earth because he's always in his short presence in this earth interested in giving and volunteering. In fact, uh, he was a volunteer firefighter in Gooshland and did a lot of other volunteering. I was said, Adam, you need to get a job. I mean, you're not going to get paid from volunteering all life. He knew better. He wanted to make some meaning of his life. With his death, my life and the rest of my family's life changed forever. It's very difficult to explain the loss of a child. In fact, there is no term to describe somebody who lost their child. And it's not because English is not my first language. It's because there is no language to describe the loss of a child. I, I once wrote uh, that it felt like part of me wants to die so I could be with him, and part of me wants to live so I could revenge that's it uh, that killed him. It's only by grace of God that I chose the latter. I once also said uh, that the way it felt immediately after his death is as if, as if your heart is ripped out of your chest and you're literally walking around, not sure whether you're in this universe or in the other universe with him. After his death, um, I question um, 
the meaning of his life and his death and the meaning of my own life and death. Fortunately, I was able to enroll in this class, learn more about addictions. And the combination of my experience, personal experience, and the knowledge that I acquired, I learned a lot about addictions. And I'm here today to make the case uh, for protecting our young people based on what I learned. I learned is that addiction is a brain disease. Uh, early exposure of young people to it, if, if substance abuse predisposed them uh, to that uh, addiction. I learned that um, that addiction uh, is uh, addictions and substance use disorder are not two similar terminology. Addiction, substance use disorder, a spectrum of, of symptoms and signs. In the past, we called them badness. Some of them, and, and this symptoms and signs, about eleven of them. If you have only a few, you are, you have a mild substance use disorder. If you have uh, four to six, you have moderate substance use disorder. If you have uh, six or more, you have severe substance use disorder, and that's addiction. So addiction is the, is the severe form of substance use disorder, not substance abuse, substance use disorder. And if you know anybody or if yourself into the mild form or moderate form, get a treatment that's easy to treat, easy to cure, easy to go into recovery. It is the severe form uh, that's difficult to treat and difficult to uh, get rid of completely and likely to stay with you. Um, just think about it as like stage four cancer. Stage four cancer is much more serious uh, than stage one or two or three. And addiction is a st the stage four uh, kind of substance use disorder. I learned that uh, addiction is a young people uh, to the extent that if, uh, for those who get exposed to, uh, get addicted before the age of, uh, of 18, of all the people that we see addicted, one out of four uh, are uh, addicted before the age of 18. For those who are exposed or become addicted uh, after the age of 21, 125, so that means the chances of somebody get addicted from exposure or from uh, misuse at early stage is much higher than that if we get exposed after uh, age 21. And that makes my case for protecting people beyond that age. I also learned that 90% of people who are walking around with addiction now are people who are addicted before the age of 18. And that's my number that initially that I said, if we could protect this people from, subs from exposure and addiction before the age of 19, we will cut down uh, addiction and cost and mortality in this country. I also learned uh, that some of the brain trait that uh, predisposes young people to experimentations are innate part of the brain. They're not badness. This are, this are uh, trait that meant survival, explorations, uh, environment. Uh, this are part of the evolutionary progressions of us moving uh, from one place to the other, trying to something different. Unfortunately, this trait are progressive through the evolution of survival of us as a human species. Unfortunately, exposure to drugs makes that counter survival. I also learned uh, that the, brain, the human brain early on, when we're born, we're born with a fraction of our brain completed. 
the frontal part of the brain is really in gestation between the ages of one the time we're born to the time 20. And any exposure of substances or, or harms or emotional issues uh, at that early age are substantially damaging, especially the frontal part. And what's in the frontal part? The choice. And what makes people experiment and take the high risk? That choice. And I think uh, the damage to the brain at, 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 during its development between the ages of one, born, and the ages of 20 is our responsibility as parents and as a society. And I think what we see now uh, clearly is a failure of that uh, society uh, in t doing that. So my uh, plea to you uh, is that let's all agree that we protect, uh, like just across civilization, across time. Age of 18 is the legal age for, or 20 are the legal ages. And it wasn't meant to be for driving, and meant to be for protection from all harms. I think we got away from that. And I plead that we come back and be the protector of our children during this early stages. And we will uh, save many. Unfortunately, that knowledge uh, had come too late for me. But by coming out and speaking about it, I just hope uh, that will save somebody else's life. One of the things that had left, that left me after Adam's death is that um, I said my soul is hardened to the suffering, to my own suffering. There's no more suffering that I could sustain that's harder than the loss of my son. Ironically, it softens and tenderizes my heart to the suffering of others. And if I could save a father or a mother the suffering that I went through, that'll be worth it all for me. Thank you very much. <laughs>